Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How California's Climate Policy is Driving a National Factory Farm Gas Bonanza. Today, we'll hear from experts about how factory farm gas is an elaborate and highly profitable greenwashing scheme that encourages the expansion of polluting factory farms and methane gas at the expense of the climate, environmental justice, and sustainable farming. I'm Rebecca Wolf with Food and Water Watch, and we're going to get started in just one minute. We highly recommend joining us on a computer for this webinar as we will be sharing really excellent slides, but if you can't today, you can view them in the recording that everyone who signed up will also be receiving. I can see we have folks hopping on, so we're just going to wait another minute to kick things off and get started. All right, I can see we've got a really good mass here of friends. So let's get started. Welcome to the webinar. Like I said, my name is Rebecca Wolf with Food and Water Watch. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers with us here today, whom I'll introduce in just one minute. Before we get started, just a quick orientation. If you aren't joining us on screen share, we highly recommend doing that by clicking the link in your email. We'll be here on video and we'll be sharing some really excellent slides. If you have a question at any point in the presentation, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to as many of those as we can throughout, uh, throughout and at the end of the webinar. You also had the opportunity to submit questions ahead of time, so we tried to incorporate those and have those ready as well. So let's begin. Right now, California's low carbon fuel standard is being used to greenwash factory farms. Instead of actually addressing climate destruction, pollution, emiss emissions, safety concerns, injustices in our energy and ag systems, the low carbon fuel standard is creating ways for energy companies and agriculture companies to continue expansion and profit off of more communities. These projects are shrouded in industry PR, misinformation, and frankly, some deception as well. Today, our panel of experts will be clarifying and shedding light to help define and demystify what is happening with factory farm gas and California climate policy. Our experts will cover how California's low carbon fuel standard, or you might hear LCFS, is driving the build out of dirty biogas or factory farm gas projects far beyond just the state's borders. And this webinar is really timely and really urgent. Over the next few weeks, California decision makers are considering re revising the LCFS to address some of these flaws that we're gonna talk about today, and they need to hear from you. So with that, I'm gonna give you some introductions to our panelists, and then I'm gonna pass it off to them. First, we're gonna have Kat Ruane. She serves as a researcher at Food and Water Watch. Writing and researching are hard hitting reports of various energy, water, and food campaigns across the country. She recently authored a major report titled The Big Oil and Big Ag Ponzi Scheme, Factory Farm Gas. Then we're going to have Tyler Lobdell. He's a staff attorney at Food and Water Watch, where he takes on factory farm pollution, corporate abuse of farmers and consumers, and false solutions like factory farm gas. He uses litigation and regulatory advocacy to hold polluters accountable and educate the public about the harms of factory farming. Then we're going to have Leslie Martinez. She is the Community Engagement Specialist at Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, she is based in Fresno, but from a small town and is very familiar with the issues facing rural San Joaquin Valley communities. She graduated from UC Berkeley, majoring in political science and minoring in public policy, and she currently leads community organizing throughout her service region, centering around community engagement and transparency. And finally, today we will hear from Lynn Utesh. Lynn co-founded Kiwani Citizens Advocating for Responsible Environmental Stewardship, or Kiwani Cares in Kiwani County, Wisconsin. Lynn lives in a community that has been impacted both by factory farms and by factory farm gas digesters. So he's gonna share his experience with us here today. Now, I've only just summarized some of the incredible work that all of these speakers do and have done. I wanna thank them all for this work, of course, and for being with us here today. With that, I'm gonna pass things off to Kat. Kat Ruane will take it away. Hi, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, so like Rebecca said, um, I recently did a lot of research about this subject. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about that. So first slide, please. So just the very basics to start with, what is 
factory farm biogas, what do we mean when we're talking about this subject? So like I said, this is really Big Ag and Big Oil's newest greenwashing scheme. They want to market this gas as a renewable and clean energy that's going to somehow eliminate all methane emissions from factory farms. You may have also heard it being referred to as renewable natural gas or RNG. And as we'll see in a moment, more realistically and more accurately, it's just factory farm gas. So this factory farm gas is produced from animal manure or other animal byproducts. So that could include things like animal trimmings or poultry litter. This waste is all put into a huge oxygen-free tank known as an anaerobic digester. Bacteria works inside that machine and out the other end comes this gas and even more waste. Now, the biogas that comes out could be used for electricity or for heating, or it can be sent over to a refinery so that it can be injected into existing natural gas pipelines, or it can also be used as a vehicle fuel. This part is really where the money comes in, and this is also the part that has the more methane than the raw biogas content. Next slide, please. So Food and Water Watch in our recent report did some digging into the companies that are really getting involved in funding these digesters. And perhaps unsurprisingly, a lot of big oil or big ag names are popping up as the front runners. So for the big oil side, we have Chevron, BP, and Shell really taking control. And then for big ag, it's really Smithfield getting involved here. Purdue and Tyson are kind of just getting their feet wet in the area, but Smithfield has been involved in this for over a decade and have promised to put this factory farm gas on 100% of their finishing farms. So in our research, we found that the big oil and gas giants are invested in or are buying from at least 143 different digesters or upgrading facilities. This is not all done in-house. They have a lot of joint ventures or partnerships with independent firms to get this done. And I'm not gonna go through all of those partnerships now because there are far too many, but I will note the biggest name there is California Bioenergy or CalBio, which works very closely with Chevron to develop and design these digester projects. And as we're gonna hear more in a little bit, some of these are generating credits from those low carbon fuel standard programs in California. Next slide, please. So why is it greenwashing? There are a ton of reasons why it's greenwashing. I am going to cover mostly the emission side of things here, particularly when it comes to methane emissions. So on factory farms, methane emissions largely come from two sources. That's manure management and enteric fermentation which is just a natural part of the cow's digestive process. Now, manure accounts for about 9% of methane emissions in the United States. If that were to all magically be removed by these digesters, we would still be left with the fact that there are 27% of the U.S.'s methane production comes from enteric fermentation, and digesters do nothing to address that portion of the methane stream. So that's problem one. Number two is just the fact that when you burn this fuel as an end use, it's essentially the same as burning fossil fuels. It produces similar pollutants, it harms the environment in the same way, and you're still pumping gas into the atmosphere that we really don't need it to be there. So clearly, this cannot be a solution to climate change if you're pumping more things into the atmosphere. Next slide, please. And another huge greenwashing problem with this technology is just the fact that it does not work. So these digesters are extremely leaky. Their leakage rates could be as high as 15%. And 15% is even higher than traditional and oil and gas supply chain leaks. So this is a huge, huge problem. And Food and Water Watch wanted to look a little bit deeper at this problem with these so-called super emitters. And we found pretty serious evidence that just lines up exactly with what residents have been saying. So we used some satellite imaging, we mapped out images of methane plumes, and we overlaid the geographical data of digesters that are involved in this LCFS program. And a methane plume is essentially just a cloud of methane that's so large it's being picked up by satellite imaging. So essentially not something you would think would be coming from this technology that's supposedly solving that problem. But that's not exactly what we found, right? We found 16 different dairy operations 
that released these huge methane plumes after their digesters were installed. Again, all of which are feeding into the LCFS program. These farms emitted 59 different plumes over just the past few years, with some of them as high as 1,700 kilograms of methane per hour. So for reference, a super emitter in the imaging system that we were using is classified as just 10 kilograms per hour. Clearly, that is far above that. We also were able to calculate the fact that if 50 of these plumes emitted for just one hour, it would produce the same amount of emissions as driving a car 45 times around the equator. So just an absolutely mind-boggling amount of pollution being produced under the guise of supposedly helping the climate. Next slide, please. So to put some visuals along with these stats, um, this map here shows the different digesters that were located within California and emitting these plumes. So you can note there's 15 of them here. And if you remember the last slide, there were only 16 total, meaning that California has a major, major problem with these super emitters. You can also note how clustered together they are, which you know is reference to just where factory farms are sited, but also how clustered these projects are and how all of the effects are very localized in these neighborhoods. Next slide, please. And this here, courtesy of Carbon Mapper, is a visualization of that extremely large methane plume I was talking about. So this one was the one emitting 1,700 kilograms of methane an hour, which is obviously a massive amount of pollution. But you can also note in the corner there that they had several other massive plumes within the same month. This is clearly ongoing problem at farms, and it's clearly not a solution. Next slide, please. And finally, it's also important to note that 11 of these projects were developed or put into the LCFS system by CalBio or California Bioenergy, so that same company that's working so closely with Chevron to boost their climate credentials. This is one of those examples. This is one of their cluster systems, um, which is part of the reason those emitters are so close to each other on the first map I showed. That's because they oftentimes will use, you know, a central pipeline to inject the gas into or a central upgrading facility for all the digesters in the area. That's kind of the cheapest way to do it. So that's the way they're going to do it. And this one clearly had a huge problem with methane plumes. And as all of these farms continue colluding the region, CalBio continues reaping in the money and the communities are the ones that suffer. So next slide, please. So that is it for me. This really barely kind of scraped the surface of biogas. So I would encourage you to check out our new report if you're looking to learn more. But we will also hear from our other great presenters about why this is more greenwashing. So I'll pass it back to Rebecca. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Kat. I wanted to give folks a quick reminder, like Kat mentioned, we're going to be emailing out these resources. We are going to be emailing out the recording. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A button as we're going along. I already see a really great one in there. Um, we'll try to either answer them there or we'll answer them live at the end. Um, we're also going to be dropping a link to take action in the chat now and again throughout the webinar. So be sure to, do, to sign that. Tyler, our next speaker, Tyler Lobdell at Food and Water Watch, is going to talk more about that action and how California's transportation policy, the low carbon fuel standard, plays into all of this. So Tyler, take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And thanks, Kat, um, for getting us started with all that great, great content. Um, so yeah, I'm Tyler, I'm staff attorney with Food and Water Watch. And you know my primary focus is on environmental pollution and public health risks posed by large factory farms. And so that's the lens that, that I and that Food and Water Watch approaches these, these factory farm gas and digester issues from. And the reason I say that is because I think it's really easy to be confused about the scope of this issue when you're only coming at it from a climate perspective, when all you're thinking about is methane, putting aside the, the disparities that, that Kat just discussed. Um, you really have to look at this in a holistic framework and look at the factory farm model to understand what factory farm gas and programs like the low carbon fuel standard actually do on the ground. And that's because these programs entrench and reward the underlying factory farm system um, without addressing really almost all of the pollution problems and public health issues that come along with that. 
So it really monetizes a problem without solving any of the underlying issues. And so that surface water pollution from factory farms, folks may have heard about fish kills and E. coli contamination and harmful algal blooms. It's drinking water contamination, odors, flies, other nuisances, emissions of air pollutants. Um, and the scientific reality is that biogas production at factory farms um, has the strong tendency to exacerbate many of these pollution problems, not, not solve them or alleviate them. So you go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna to try to explain pretty quickly like what is this LCFS thing that we're talking about? I'm gonna go into the mechanics of it a little bit and then I'm gonna discuss the core problems as they relate to the issues we're discussing today. So the LCFS is uh, administered by the California Air Resources Board and it was intended to reduce the climate footprint of transportation fuels in California. And it does that by creating a, a credit trading scheme. Um, and essentially the way it works is if you're a transportation fuel producer or importer in California, then you have to meet what's called a carbon intensity target or a benchmark. And that carbon intensity is, is really just the carbon footprint of the overall fuel mix. And that's measured in grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. So it's, it's measuring how much emissions are you, uh, how many greenhouse gas emissions are you releasing per sort of unit of energy that you're producing for a transportation um, fuel. And, um, you know, on one side of this are companies like Chevron, like Kat was talking about, who are considered deficit generators because their fuel has a greater carbon intensity than that benchmark that CARB sets. So that's on one side of this trading ledger are the Chevrons of the world. On the other side are fuel producers who have a purportedly lower carbon intensity than that benchmark. And so they get to generate credits, right? So on one side, you have the fossil fuel companies, who either have to produce fewer fossil fuels or buy these credits to meet their legal obligations for their overall greenhouse gas emissions. And then on the other side, you have these credit generators. And those come in the form of a variety of different types of fuels. So ethanol, quote unquote, biodiesel, aviation fuel, solar arrays. And then what we're talking about today, factory farm gas. And factory farm gas projects or sort of take advantage of this program in three different ways, either as compressed natural gas or quote unquote renewable natural gas, um, burning biogas in a dirty engine to produce electricity that they then feed into the grid or for hydrogen production. And so we're not gonna get into hydrogen in depth today, but it really is the, the long game for this factory farm industry is to establish and prop up a dirty hydrogen economy of the future where we produce hydrogen from these dirty polluting fuels. And last thing I'll note is Rebecca alluded to this, but even though this is a California run by the California Air Resources Board, it has national impacts because those credit generators um, can come from states throughout the country and do come from states throughout the country. So right now we have factory farms as far flung as New York State, Missouri, um, and states all the way in between over to California that are generating credits from their factory farm pollution. So next slide, please. So, you know, one of the major problems with a program like this is the perverse incentives that it puts into place. So as a baseline, like in a nutshell, the basic premise of how these structures are, are, are put together is that the biggest factory farm polluter gets the biggest rewards from the program. And this uh, graph you're looking at here are just averages of all the different carbon intensities that are assigned to the different fuels that generate credits in the program. And you'll see that there's negative 100 and then plus 100 and that most of these values are falling in there. And the extreme negative, you're seeing these lines, you know, travel out to negative 500 and more. Those are all factory farm gas projects. And so factory farm gas, um, they're called pathways or fuel producers get by far the most lucrative treatment under this program compared to any other fuel by a very, very significant margin. And so what does that mean sort of in reality? Well, what that means is that when CARB adopted this avoided methane crediting policy, which assumes that factory farms and liquid lagoons emitting methane are just natural parts of the landscape that are unavoidable. When they adopted that policy, it, 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 it shot off what's called, well, what the industry itself calls a manure gold rush. It really plummeted the carbon intensity for those fuels into extreme negative terrain that makes them extremely lucrative. And to give an example of how, um, how much that skews the incentives in this program, 
if you compare, um, you know, a solar array that's directly charging electric vehicles, you know, zero emission electric vehicles, that's going to get a carbon intensity of zero in this program. And that's like the gold standard for what California is moving towards in the long run for transportation. But um, a factory farm gas project can get, you know, negative 500 carbon intensity, negative 700 carbon intensity. We've seen up to negative 790 carbon intensity. And what that means is um, if you're a developer, it is um, you're going to have a on paper, a better climate footprint by running four uh, heavy duty trucks running on compressed natural gas and emitting greenhouse gas emissions. So long as one of those is running on factory farm gas, that is going to have a better climate footprint, according to the LCFS, than four zero combustion, fully EV heavy duty trucks, right? So the incentive structure here is really dissuades money from going to the real solutions and that's combustion free transportation. And just want to sort of note that you know, the underlying system that leads to these lucrative pathways that allows factory farm operators to get this huge payout um, is the liquid waste lagoon and spray field system that causes all sorts of other public health and environmental problems, again, that are left unaddressed by biogas production. You can go to the next slide, please. So the results on the ground, um, as the Wall Street Journal called it out here, it's a gold rush in cow manure. And so we're seeing expansions of factory farms because the more manure you have, the more money you can make. We're seeing consolidation of factory farms because as Kat alluded to, the closer you are to this gas infrastructure, the better you're off. Um, and oftentimes you have uh, biogas developers setting up centralized digesters and pulling from a variety of different factory farms, again, encouraging more animals in a smaller uh, number of acres. We're actually seeing increased greenhouse gas emissions because the way this program is set up, if, uh, if you make a choice anywhere along the line as a factory farm operator that reduces your global greenhouse or your greenhouse gas emissions, you actually get dinged under this program. So you have every incentive to produce as much methane from your waste as possible so then you can monetize it. I already mentioned that it dissuades real solutions. And just as a foundational matter, it entrenches factory farming and all the problems that come along with it. Next slide, please. And we have other speakers who are going to touch on this much better than I. So just quickly, you know, this program is really causing a, a profound and alarming environmental injustice. As I've mentioned, the low carbon fuel standard monetizes a system of pollution, exacerbates that system of pollution. It rewards more pollution in communities already faced with severely degraded air and water. Um, and last thing I'll note is that CARB deliberately adopted policy choices for the low carbon fuel standard that allows factory farms throughout the country to generate LCF credits, even when they're in violation of local, state, or federal regulations. So a factory farm in Wisconsin or New York State um, can be violating um, Wisconsin state law and polluting Wisconsin communities, and the California Air Resources Board will ignore that and will continue to allow them to generate credits. So last slide, please. Uh, Rebecca mentioned this, but just want to flag that we have a really important opportunity for reform right now. Written comments are due to the California Air Resources Board by February 20th, and then there will be a public hearing on March 21st. And we don't have time to go into the details, but the proposal from CARB staff right now is atrocious. It doubles down on factory farm gas, it ignores the impacts we're discussing today, and it completely ignores the environmental justice issues faced by Californians in the Central Valley. So this is the time to be heard. Uh, this is the time to push back. And that I'll pass it back to Rebecca. Thank you, Tyler. And just to note, we really wanted to add some of these photos in here before we, we go on to the next um, slides, just to kind of show you visually what we're talking about as we move into our next speakers. This, these are some of what the, some of the projects that we're talking about will look like. Um, so we've got large dairy digester projects and other sorts of, of large dairy waste projects that are really the crux of the issue here. So thank you for walking us through all of that, Tyler. Remember, don't forget to take action using the link that is in the chat. Submit your questions to the, the Q&A button. And next, we're going to hear from one of our guests, Leslie Martinez at Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. On to you, Leslie. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Leslie with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Um, uh, just kind of starting off by saying thanks to Food and Water Watch for putting this together, talking about cow uh, 
uh, manure has turned into one of my favorite things. Uh, so just a little bit about the organization. Um, we're located in the heart of California, which is the San Joaquin Valley, um, but we also work in the Eastern Coachella Valley. We work on a local, uh, regional, and also statewide uh, organizing structure where we work with communities that are being directly impacted by a lot of, uh, specifically in this uh, in this situation, a lot of uh, we, a lot of environmental justice issues, but uh, specifically around dairies and the contamination that goes uh, on when you live next to a mega dairy. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is definitely rooted in community priorities. So like we don't really set out an agenda. We really work with communities to educate them on like what's happening in their community, on uh, how how we can work together to not just create like a you know a breadcrumb solution, but rather really focusing in on how do we develop a way to change the status quo moving forward. Um, before I begin, I know that a lot of folks are often not super familiar for the San Joaquin Valley, so I think it's important that we set the scene as to like why is this the perfect place for these type of projects? Why did why were why did the dairies come to the San Joaquin Valley, and why are we and why are why are we talking about it, and why is it so specific to the San Joaquin Valley? And also, I think it leads into like how the LCFS has been able to really exploit um, the communities uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. So before I start, um, San Joaquin Valley used to be, uh, it, you know, not it still is Yoka territory, which was a uh, indigenous group of folks, um, and when and you know. It is actually one of the most transformed uh, areas in the world, meaning that it looks nothing like when the Yokuts like were tending to the um, were, were tending to the land. Uh, it's and so after that, the story that really I think um, started in the San Juan, not started, but I say is a big factor of what why we're here today is because it's a story of extraction and exploit and exploiting people. Uh, since the beginning, it has always been oil and gas and agricultural. And when I say agriculture, I'm not talking about the like three Swiss chards in my backyard. I'm talking about mega dairies that are uh, three to 4,000 heads per dairy and right next to communities, right? Um, the other part that is really important to remember as we have this conversation is that a lot of the communities we work with are what we call unincorporated community, communities, meaning they don't have a direct form of government like a city council, but rather they're kind of looped into board of supervisors. So they often, the communities I work with, have to travel 30 to 45 minutes to go to the places where they're discussing and making decisions that are going to impact them. It's also important to remember that these communities are incorporated and they did start being incorporated and um, have remained incorporated because um, this is a lasting effect of segregation. So uh, during the Dust Bowl, we had a lot of black migrant farm workers come and move into the San Joaquin Valley, but they were not allowed to live in the cities. And so they were pushed out into these super rural areas where they could one, provide cheap labor to the giant agricultural businesses. Uh, but while they were out there, uh, governments withhold some of these basic services. So we're talking water, wastewater services, and like basic housing. Um, as the populations have changed, so uh, a lot of black folks have moved out of the San Joaquin Valley, some are still here, but really who came into those unincorporated communities um, were Latinx farm workers um, through the last maybe 40 years. Um, and we're still seeing those same conditions of that like lasting racism and segregation. For example, most of the communities we work with don't have clean drinking water. We are one of the probably worst air base, the actual worst basin, uh, one, two, we have three of them uh, in the state of California for just being the most polluted in the nation. Um, and no public health infrastructure, which I also think is super important. When we think of California, I think a lot of folks think of this like super progressive, like front end at like always doing things first, but really in the San Joaquin Valley, we're actually having a problem with the closing of a major medical hospitals that are sometimes the only hospital that serve one to two counties, sometimes three. Um, and this set up perfectly for why we're here today. And that's because when the dairies got kicked out of sunny Los Angeles for their smell and their nuisance and the problems that they were bringing to SoCal, they said, we know, we know where to put them. We'll put them in the San Joaquin Valley where folks, it's the perfect refuge really for dairies where folks, one, are so separated from where decisions are being made. And then two, um, we can get that cheap labor and, and we don't really have to be accountable to anybody. 
Um, can I go to the next slide, please? So that's like what really brought us to this and where we're at today. Um, on the left, you'll see it's my probably one of my favorite pictures, but it shows you uh, the density of dairy cows in the state of California. Um, and it's really important that we notice how the San Joaquin Valley is a, distinctively, this is a very distinctive issue to this, uh, to our region, because we are the place where they said, you guys can go here, you can continue to store your your liquefied manure in these giant lagoons um, and we will we're just going to let you do it if it you know whatever problems come at it we're just going to turn a blind eye so then if you look over to the right side you'll also see a map uh, that shows the contamination of nitrate which is the main main contaminant that comes from dairy waste um, when it seeps into the groundwater um, it is for it, it, it's really, it's not a boil type of situation. It's something that requires a lot of uh, treatment in order to clean it, and it's also really expensive. And if you look at those hyper, uh, the, the more red parts, those are, that is pretty, um, I think it was, uh, I think it was Kat who had the map of the methane, very similar to her map. Um, and it's important that like, although we see a map, I, I want folks to understand that in this, like these little red spots here, um, this is where we have schools. This is where I went to school. I'm from Tulare County. This is where we have daycares. This is where we um, have families who are living and breathing this every single day. Um, and coincidence, I think not. <laughs> so can we go to the next slide, please? It is no surprise to anyone on this call that we know that dairies are the biggest con contributor to methane. Uh, they are, they, it has been an ongoing problem that the state has known about for a very long time. Uh, but the other part that I'm going to talk about a little bit more, though, is how that impacts community residents. Um, communities are living next to not just one. I think oftentimes people think like, oh, one community lives next to one dairy. No, the community I work with, uh, it's called Pix Pixley, California. It's about a 15 minute drive from Tulare, um, the city of Tulare. And you will find that there is a community there of about six, 7,000 folks. Um, and they are surrounded in a one mile radius by, uh, or five mile radius by 15 dairies, all above like 4,000 head of cows. Um, from what we know of, because the dairy industry is also allowed to like kind of withhold information from community, um, that's our best estimate. But really what we're seeing with, with residents is um, high rates of asthma, dust, the smells, um, you know, flies. Residents in the, in the community of uh, Pixley have often talked, they also have a, a dairy digester cluster. So they also have not only the dairies, but they also have this like massive, this thing that's producing energy, right? And like residents have often complained about the smell of ammonia, of like really intense, um smell of um manure i'm trying really hard not to say the s word <laughs> and uh more importantly it's like they're just watching all these clouds and like come out of this um this factory and i say factory because for the longest time community residents didn't even know what this digester was um and at the same time while community is really in the dark about this on the other end of it we have these um producers um that are making this gas and saying how it's like saving communities air quality it's making the smell less um, and community residents will probably be the first to tell you that that's not true uh, i think it's also important to remember that all of these contaminants are going up into the air um, it's not a it's a very different from a factory where maybe you know it's a 16 hours this is like a 24 hour seven days a week 365 even on major holidays like this the dairies keep going um and unfortunately for residents a lot of the a lot of the air the impacts on air quality um just get sidebarred because right because their big focus is methane that is you know that's kind of this big ticket item that um uh, resident that really has been prioritized above local air impacts and community residents um can i go to the next slide please and that's just like one part because it's important to remember that air quality that comes uh, comes off the digester, off the dairy, that's one part. The second part is water. Uh, I think a lot of people often forget that the 
San Joaquin Valley is in a horrendous drought or it's not in a drought anymore, but you know, we have levels of subsidence that uh, frankly are, are terrifying communities, destroying infrastructure. Uh, and there we have two issues and that's water quality and water quantity. Uh, so the first thing, I, when I think about water and I have folks think about water, uh, one dairy cow drinks about uh, a water heater's worth of water uh, a daily. And that's on a good day. That's not on one of our hundred um, uh, over hundred degree weather days. Um, in fact, we the I think that the dairies in California are it's like a proven fact that they've contaminated the entire San Joaquin Valley with nitrate uh, levels. Uh, you can there is a water board proceeding going around that. Um, and not only is are these the way that they store it in these giant lagoons, like it definitely seeps into the groundwater, but oftentimes too it it gets to it they sprinkle other excess manure on cropland so dairies aren't just it's not just a dairy typically that's out there you'll also see a lot of almonds and uh, pistachios specifically and pixley and we're seeing that and we're watching as just like manure continues to infiltrate communities surrounding them uh, can i go to the next slide please and so i i think it's really important that as we continue to talk about uh we think about what this looks like. I, I, I'm sorry for the super graphic photo, but it's really important for people to understand that the amount of water that a dairy uses, they're pumping groundwater wells that are often like 100 to 200 feet deeper than a small private well. So communities often go either with really low water pressure, sometimes wells you know the well will stop working. Um, and because the dairy is using so much water not only to um, for the cows to drink, but also because they're pushing all of that manure out into this lagoon. Um, and that is considered, uh, a, and that is a choice. You'll often hear from industry that, well, you know, once you once you have a water-based manure, you can't really do dry scraping. Um, no, it's just the most cost-effective. So it's not like this extra byproduct of milk. Like it is a, it is a, it is a, con it is a conscious decision that a lot of these folks are making in order to save a, a buck or two. Um, and this is what people live next to. And and I'm and it's really important that we recognize that that people are living next to 15 of these in a community where I work. Um, and they have no way to push back on it. They have no way to, um, you know, in Pixley, for example, they do have nitrate contamination and are told not to drink the water that comes out of their faucets um, because it could lead to various diseases. Um, the scariest one for me is always blue uh, blue baby syndrome. So oftentimes you'll have residents being told to make sure that they wash like uh, infant uh, products with bottled water to ensure that they don't become contaminated. And um, this is just the reality of what it's like to live next to these uh, giant um, projects. Like it's day in and day out. Can I go to the next slide, please? But over the years, community residents like were tired of seeing how the state of California through LCFS kept giving these polluters money to pollute, essentially. Uh, we were watching, while these communities don't have clean water infrastructure, they don't have, or they have really incredibly unaffordable water rates because they have to clean up the nitrate, um, while residents are driving often two, two hours uh, to, to the nearest hospital for asthma attacks. Uh, the state of California has essentially said, here you go, here's some money, you're cleaning up the methane, thank you so much, you guys are fantastic. It's become so lucrative that we're watching dairies expand in the region, um, all while the water, the air, the smell, and the health of our communities is definitely um, suffering. I think it's important to also recognize that like, when this group came together, that was one part, the Pixley folks that are like, we have the digester, we have um, so many dairies, like we need to do something about this. And then on the flip side, we were also seeing communities um, in other parts of, of the state of California that are like, we have a small dairy, it, it's going to expand and its mitigation said it's gonna be a digester to clean it up. Like, is, like that's what they've decided is going to help um, with the impacts that 10,000 or that 5,000 more cows are going to do uh, to our community. And um, the, basically, we got this group together of residents from throughout the San Joaquin Valley to address these issues. Can I go to the next slide, please? And we've started 
uh, and we started in, oh, can we go to the web back? Yeah, this one. And so over the last year, we've been doing a lot of advocacy along Tyler, um, who I'm super grateful to have uh, his support throughout all of these campaigns, but we've really met with board members. We've tried to change the narrative that this grass is clean because it's it's not clean. It's at the expense of communities. It's, it's at the expense of residents who, uh, you know, are driving up and down to get to hospitals. It's buying water and it's living in these areas where often they're told, well, if you don't like it here, you can just leave. Uh, but you, you can't just leave when that's your home and you can't afford to go anywhere else and we're in the housing crisis. Uh, so community residents have been engaging with the California legislature, whether it's passing bills, trying to pass bills um, for uh, to make sure that the LCF is transparent um, and has guardrails for communities, um, working with board members on the on CARB. Uh, and at the end of the day, all we're trying to say is like the LCFS is an incentivizing program that's making these dairies bigger and they're polluters and why are we rewarding polluters? Like that's not what it is. So for the last year and here we're getting gearing up for year two, of a lot of advocacy around um, really just ensuring that communities have access to to healthy neighborhoods and, and joy. Can I go to the next slide, please? And so at the end of the day, um, you know, as you continue to hear about LCFS, I just hope that you remember that the San Joaquin Valley, you know, we're not a dumping ground for anyone. We're not, you know, you're, you're not going to produce this very clean green fuel at the expense of children and animals and families um, that make up the San Joaquin Valley. Um, so we're, we're not gonna give up. We don't have any, ex we, we expect not to give up ever. We're gonna continue fighting the fight to ensure that programs like these that incentivize polluters um, end um, for com because community residents deserve better. They, they frankly just deserve a place. They, get, they should be allowed to go home and um, open their windows and not fear that flies are gonna come in. Um, so we go to the last slide. And um, that is a quick summary, a little bit of all the work we've been doing. But if there's any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. And again, thank you so much to Food and Water Watch for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leslie. I think that, that was a really fabulous presentation. I love ending with awesome organizing pictures. I think really, really invaluable insight for our audience uh, today as well, who we've got a really steady audience um, who's joined us here today. I think you even got some of our questions um, that people had been asking in there as well. So really excellent. Um, now we're going to pass to our final speaker, Lynn Utesh of Kiwani Cares, um, who's going to share what this looks like from Wisconsin um, and give us some insight. So thank you, Lynn. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, you know, my name is Lynn Utesh, and I live in Kewanee County, Wisconsin, uh, where I farm with my wife, Nancy, on 150 acres where we raise 100% grass-fed beef and a rotational grazing ro rotational grazing system. So that's uh, uh, I'm also a co-founder of Kewanee Cares, or Kewanee Citizens Advocating Responsible Envir Environmental Stewardship. Uh, that was formed in 2011. So that's, uh, uh, let me give you a little background on Kewanee County. So in Kiwani County, all three of our rivers are on the EPA's impaired waters list. Uh, year after year, we have over 30% of our wells tested are contaminated with E. coli and or nitrates. That's uh, uh, according to research done by Marquette University, all of our rivers and streams have antibiotic resistance with uh, most of them having multiple uh, resistance to multiple antibiotics. Uh, for those of you that know what that means, that means we have MRSA in our, wa in our water, in our rivers and streams. Uh, Kiwani County has been classified by Dr. Mark Borkart, USDA Agriculture Research Service, as water which would be expected to be found in a third world country. Uh, due to all the research that we've had and all of the issues that we're, the, that we deal with. In 2014, we petitioned the US EPA to invoke their emergency powers under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And as of today, we have yet to have any official response from, from EPA. Uh, Kiwani County is home to 17 dairy CAFOs. Uh, uh, just like the last speaker, we live with it all around us. That's uh, Kiwani County also has five di digesters associated with those, those CAFOs. Uh, 
we also have three of our CAFOs that transfer uh, manure outside of our county to two other digesters that are in the adjacent counties next to us. We also just recently found out that there is going to be a $45 million digester project uh, that not only includes a digester, but also includes an expansion of that current CAFO. Uh, and that's one of the things that we see is, you know, digesters are a fuel for expansion and increased manure production in our community. Uh, you know, over the last 10 years, we've had a huge push for the digesters. And unfortunately, we're the citizens that have to live with those false promises. Uh, I think the, the big thing that we have to understand is what, you know, what is a digester actually doing? You know, that's, uh, most people think that digesters are, are actually reducing or eliminating manure. But uh, like, again, Mark Borkhart, used the USDA researcher, along with Becky Larson from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, have stated from their research that what goes into a digester comes out of a digester. The manure has not been eliminated. It's not going away. It may change forms. It may become, there may be liquid portion of it and a solid portion of it, but it's still the same manure. And unfortunately, that manure is still being land applied. And it's not the facility itself that is, is a lot of the, where the pollution is coming from. It's when that manure is put out on those fields and it is allowed to leach down into our drinking water or into our rivers and streams. So that's uh, one of the other things they talk about with digesters is you get pathogen re reduction. Well, digesters are extremely finicky. They work sometimes and they don't others. Uh, you can get, a, again, from research that we've seen that uh, you can get a 0% reduction in, in pathogens all the way up to a 99.9% .9 reduction in pathogens. Unfortunately, even at that 99% rate, it's still not safe what's coming out of those digesters. The pathogen load in the manure itself going in is so high that it is still not dropped down to a safe level for application out onto the landscape. That's uh, the other thing that with digesters is they're in the state of Wisconsin, they're allowed to, to accept industrial waste. Last year alone, there was 44,660,000 gallons brought into Kewanee County and put into to our digesters. Unfortunately, what that industrial waste is, as soon as it leaves, goes into a manure pit, as soon as it goes added to the manure, it is classified as manure. That industrial waste then is land applied again for those citizens that live in those communities to, to have to deal with, the, deal with those situations. And we don't even know exactly what it is. So that's uh, the other thing that we have to, you know, all of this really comes down to, and what is never take, seem to be taking into account is, these are human health issues. You know, all of these things are a direct impact on the human health and then the communities that, that, that they're bringing this to. It's being touted as something that's gonna fix these issues, yet we see that the, the very issues that they're so-called touting as being eliminated are still in existence and are still occurring. So that's, uh, again, uh, another issue that we have is California Air Resource Board is doing no enforcement. That's here in Kiwani County, we have uh, basically every one of these facilities has environmental violations uh, pretty much every single year, yet there is no mechanism for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources to report to California. And even worse is there's nobody in California that is actively looking to find those environmental, vi environmental uh, environmental uh, uh, violations that are taking place. And so these facilities, even when they do violate the law, continue to have uh, income coming from these digesters. So that's, uh, the other thing is, you know, what comes out of a digester is anaerobic. That ruins our soil. So we are literally making it so that we are going to have reduced food production going on from the soils that that's applied. 
Uh, I can see personally say that uh, with the land, I have uh, manure is applied directly adjacent to my farm that comes from a digester. After that manure is applied, it, all of the earthworms come to the surface and are dead. That that's, uh, you know, and part of that issue is the volumes that are being applied. That's a, uh, so in, in Wisconsin and my community, uh, they're applying between 16,000 gallons per acre and 32,000 gallons per acre of liquid manure. That's, that is, you know, astronomical numbers. And yet we're wondering why is it that, that our groundwater is becoming contaminated? You know, if you're, there, there's no way that that would be taking place under a natural grazing or, you know, type system where the animals would actually have to be out there on the land. That that's, uh, so, you know, we need to make sure that, that we, that, you know, these are issues that are, are directly affecting everything that's taking place by, by having that dead soil, it allows all of those pathogens to migrate down through that soil and into our groundwater even faster. That's, uh, we've worked with engineers that's, and the biggest thing is, you know, as they look at what these digester companies and the government is saying is going on. They can't get the the engineering to, to add up. The, there is way too many assumptions in their math. They are utilizing numbers that are not uh, realistic for what's taking place in our communities. It's uh, uh, we actually have uh, digesters from the numbers that have been uh, publicly acquired in our community that uh, the cost of production on a per cow per day. Uh, the cost of production for a digester to operate is a dollar ten dollar ten per cow, so that's that's what it costs to operate that digester. Now, to, if they're going to sell that natural gas, that on that same per cow basis, they will only receive seventeen cents per cow per day. But here's the problem: they get from California and for other and from other government programs, they can make three dollars per day of carbon credits per cow. So what's happening is this is not even it from an engineering perspective, this shouldn't, doesn't even add up. You know, we are actually paying more money for the carbon credits than that gas is worth. You know, if this had to just work on its own and survive on its, on, as a standalone free enterprise system, nobody would be doing this. There's no way that you could get the value out of the gas that's produced to make match the cost of the production. That's uh, the other thing is, you know, these facilities are being placed in in on agricultural land. That's uh, having talked with people that are part of the oil and gas industry. This is no different than most refineries. You know, and it also has the exact inherent. Uh, dangers that go with those those refineries and here we are we're putting them out into rural communities next to people's homes that's and there's no oversight that uh, as to what's taking place there these should be regulated and also be put in places uh, in an industrial park where it should could be zoned properly uh, and have actually the, the exact same oversight as the oil and gas industry does so you know, we are endangering the people in our communities. That's you know, we have seen that you know all of these the digesters are supposed to be there that are supposed to alleviate all the issues. Yet we live in a community that has yet to see any of those things actually come to fruitation. That's a uh, you know a lot of times they say that this is this is a way to to fix the 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 waste stream for the the animal agriculture. And the reality is agriculture doesn't have a waste stream problem. What it has is a confinement and concentration problem. So we don't need digesters if we don't have the confinement and concentration in very, very large numbers of, of these animals. So, you know, we're living with the very issues that we're trying to, to you know, these are touted as to fix, yet everything that they're saying is still occurring in my community. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Lynn. We, I was just thinking, I keep thinking about the earthworm visual that you shared, and I think that's really powerful. Just a really powerful testimony to 
you know, what you're dealing with, what you've had to learn, uh, and also just what you're seeing with your own eyes on the soil, uh, really, really, again, invaluable for folks who are on this call to, to hear and understand. So one last time, we're going to drop the petition in the chat and drop your organization's Facebook for folks to check out. Please check out Lynn's organization. Before we get into the q and A, I I know we're close on time here, but I think we had just such a, uh, a huge a dearth of, of explanation on really what's going on here. It's a complicated issue. There are a ton of different impacts. And so I think really, really fabulous um, testimony from everyone to, to kind of even ahead of time, get at, get at these questions. So um, very quickly, really important to take action now because of that closing comment period. I just want to emphasize that one more time. All of our panelists laid out the reasons factory farm gas is simply a smoke screen for real action on climate change and factory farm pollution. So please be sure to take action. We are tight here. So since we have four of us, I'm going to go for one minute each, one question, kind of a rapid fire Q&A session. Um, I'm going to start with Kat. First, first, first and last question for you, Kat. How does the fossil fuel industry or big oil benefit from LCFS propping up this biogas system just beyond their financials? Yeah, so there are a couple ways this happens. Um, I think the most fundamental piece is just that biogas and all of these digesters are inherently dependent on fossil fuel infrastructure. So for instance, the gas has to get from one place to another, right? The primary way that the industry is doing that right now is through these pipelines. And that could be building out brand new pipelines or entrenching existing pipelines. Um, you know, these companies are injecting the gas into these local lines for usage and keeping those in use. If it's not pipelines, it could be heavy duty shipping trucks. So those are hauling materials back and forth, creating more emissions every single time. One Shell project, for example, estimated using 100 trucks every single day in order to just operate their facility. So it just, all of this just ensures that if these companies want us to tout biogas as the solution, fossil fuel infrastructure needs to stick around, even as we desperately need to phase all of this out. All right. So I'm hearing diversifying their big corporate portfolio, right? Um, thanks, Kat. Tyler, I'm going to turn to you. A question we hear a lot uh, is kind of, maybe you can debunk this, but manure emits methane anyway. So why isn't it why is it bad to put this to use somehow? Yeah, I'll be I'll be really quick. This is a really important point. Thanks, Rebecca. So methane emissions from manure are not a problem of raising animals. Methane emissions from manure are a problem of the factory farm system of, of producing food and fiber. So you only have this greenhouse gas problem from the manure once you start liquefying the manure and, and holding it in these cesspools. That is the source of the methane emissions. And so, for example, a pasture-based dairy doesn't have this problem. And so, you know, I think, I think Lynn really nailed it on the head when he said, you know, this isn't, the, the problem here is concentration and confinement. The reality that these animals are utterly detached from the landscape and are held in confinement. And the reality then is that their manure has to be managed in these cesspools. Um, that's the problem, right? And so, um, we can solve this by having sustainable, smaller scale regional farming. Um, we don't need these tech fixes. We don't need Shell and Chevron to be partnering with Smithfield to, uh, to help us with a, a livable future. Thanks, Tyler. I'm gonna go to Lynn and then close with Leslie. Lynn, uh, we, industry, governments, there are a lot of entities that are touting digesters as solutions. Okay. In your experience, do they actually get rid of odors? Do they address pollution in your community? I think you touched on a lot of this, again, the, the earthworm visual, but um, what's your response to that? They, no, they do not. That's a, uh, you know, a digester one, it changes the odors. So uh, especially, you know, I live in a, a dairy, dairy community. That's a, so it changes the odor. It makes it go from being, uh, a lot of methane to all to being a lot of ammonia. So a digester can actually increase the ammonia percentage by up to 80%. And that's from the California Air Resource Board itself. So you change this the odor, you don't get rid of the odor. 
So it still smells bad. So like for us uh, ha- as a dairy, you know, having in our area with cows, it takes the cow manure and makes it smell like pig manure. So, you know, most people would say if they had the choice between the two, they'd rather have cow manure, not pig manure, but neither, neither one smells good. Uh, the other issue that you have is that, uh, you know, a lot of these government agencies are saying that the pits are actually covered. And that's where a lot of odor comes from and a lot of the, the volatile organic compounds. Uh, you know, unfortunately, in my community and, and all over the state of Wisconsin, I have yet to see a manure pit actually have a cover. Uh, you know, the largest manure pit in my community is 82 million gallons. You can't put a cover over 82 million gallons. So, you know, they use a lot of greenwashing as to what's taking place, but in reality, it's just not happening. Thanks, Lynn. That again, huge uh, and huge visual. The so we we went from Wisconsin to California. There are a bunch of other states that are also being impacted by the low carbon fuel standard um, crediting system. So we have Arizona, Idaho, Indiana, Minnesota, Missouri, Nevada, New York, Oregon, Texas, Utah, Washington, and Wisconsin. So I just wanted to give them a shout out before I close with uh, one more question to Leslie. Leslie, you talked a lot about community organizing. Um, how has CARB or the California Air Resources Board reacted to the voices of impacted residents in California that you work with? Frankly, poorly. Like just utter like. So the I the ISOR came out that really is kind of this like uh, the staff's proposal to put together this uh, you know the new the new LCFS program, and not once was any of the red like. Uh, things that community residents about like local air impacts, water impacts, uh, just public health, like not once was it mentioned throughout any of that. Um, And Tyler, as my witness, knows this is true. Uh, And I also think that this is part of this problem, though, with with the way that this program is rolled out is that we're getting people talking about, oh my gosh, these poor dairy farmers are already not making money and you just want to make it worse for them. You want the dairy industry to go away. But that is not true. I, I think that there is a place for dairies. I think that there, and I think that that place for dairies is when you don't have thousands of cows and creating, you know, it's not sustainable. And frankly, I think about, you know, I grew up in Tillery County where folks have dairies and it's just not also a sustainable practice for dairy farmers, for dairy farming, for the future of dairies. Like in reality, if we want to genuinely keep dairies around in California or in Wisconsin, wherever, they have to be truly sustainable. And that means making big changes. But while we have folks who are consolidating these dairies, making the problem bigger than they need to be, con- you know, making these problems, like confining these an- poor animals, uh, we're going to continue to have these problems. It's like one of the, it's, and it's similar, I think, back to what Kat was saying about just, and, you know, how big oil is like, trying to force us to continue to use our infrastructure. It's the time to be bold was yesterday. And unfortunately in California, like we're not seeing that. And so if anyone here is on California or has thought about joining the proceeding or commenting March 21st, they will be having a hearing and we really hope folks come out and talk about it because uh, as of now, I think that the methane number looks so good to the governor's office and to uh, other you know, bureaucrats that community residents can be sidelined and uh and uh, and dairy farmers can be like hijinks i guess so uh just really looking forward to continuing you know our advocacy alongside everybody on this uh webinar and really encourage y'all to learn more about the lcfs because even though you don't think it affects you it is not a victimless crime uh it is your gas prices the way that you use energy is all connected um to a small town in california called pixley that has thousands and thousands of cows surrounding them. Awesome. Thank you so much. And you touched on that uh, expensive, making gas expensive piece. We even, we were answering some of that in the chat. There's so much here. Um, That is all the time we have for today. Unfortunately, we could really just keep going. Um, But I think that was a really wonderful overview and discussion of why this is important for everyone, not just Californians, but everyone and Californians uh, to get involved in this work. So, 
please remember to take action on that link. Tell California regulators to stop dirty factory farm gas. Thank you for hanging with us an extra minute here. You can check out our campaigns as well as our guests' campaigns online. Help us bring other organizations, more people into this work. Look out for companies and state governments that are trying to sell biogas or factory farm gas as this miracle solution. Be vigilant. And we'll be following up with more information um, and all of that in an email soon. So thank you to our allies and our partners who shared this webinar. Thank you to our allies and our speakers who are here today. And thank you to everyone for spending some time with us. We'll see you next time.